Hi, Year 6. Happy Monday to you all as we enter our last week before half term. So for today's reading, we're going to go over chapter 22 and 23 and see where the journey takes Martine next. So we'll have a little recap of what happened at the end of chapter 1 before we get going. So at the end of chapter 1, the last bit that we read were, was as followed. So, boats that go up to the sky can only mean one thing. The dockyards in Cape Town, interrupted her grandmother. Hurry, Martine. I think they're taking him abroad. So if we remember, Jemmy had been captured um, and now Martine is in a, a real rush to try and save Jemmy. So they've been to see Grace. Um, Grace had been able to use her sort of powers, as it were, to find out where Jemmy would be and now the chase begins. So chapter 22 and chapter 23 for today. So you can just sit back, relax, find yourself a comfy spot. Um, make sure that you try and shut your eyes and imagine you're there uh, and picture all of the characters as the story unfolds. And then tomorrow and Wednesday we'll have some activities for you to do based on these chapters. And then Thursday we'll finish with chapter 24 and that will be the end of the book and then we'll have another task for you on the Friday. Okay, relax and enjoy. Here we go, chapter 22. Maybe Gwyn Thomas had driven as fast as she did on the way into Cape Town before that day, but Martine seriously doubted it. As it was, the needle on the ancient red Datsun quivered as if it was about to burst through the glass. Martine could tell that her grandmother was very anxious. But she was also very determined. She had agreed to drive Martine to the docks, but no further. If Jeremiah isn't there, we'll have to call the police, she said firmly. All Martine's protests had been in vain. The two hours that it took to reach the ocean seemed the longest of Martine's life. Every possible obstacle conspired to delay them. A police roadblock, a traffic jam, a busload of disembarking senior citizens, three loose cows ambling across the road. And all the while, Grace's prophecy kept running through Martine's head. The white giraffe is there, but not for much longer. I see much pain, much pain, much pain. They were on, the, on an inland road, and soon the wine estates, with their pristine white Cape Dutch buildings and lavender line drives, were followed by shanty towns reminiscent of the Soweto Tendai had described to Martine. Mile upon mile of rusting iron and water-stained plywood shacks, worm-ridden dogs and shifty, hungry-eyed youths. Children played in the dirt with wire toys. The fort of Tendai brought back the memory of the, of the day they'd spent together at Sawabona. Gwyn Thomas pulled off the highway and took the coastal road down the, to the waterfront. The forbidding crags of Table Mountain were draped in thick cloud. When, when tall grey cargo ships and cranes lifting containers came into view, she slowed the car to a crawl. Martine was ready to explode with impatience, but she knew that they had to find a place to hide the car. An overgrown track provided a solution. They bounced over the weeds and stones and parked under a flat-topped pine tree. Gwyn Thomas opened her door and started to get out of the car. Martine put her hand on her grandmother's sleeve. Grandmother, this is something I have to do on my own. I don't think so, Gwyn Thomas said. You're 11 years old and you're an hour and a half from home. But Martine stood her ground. It's my fault. It's my fault that Jemmy's been captured. And if he's hurt, that'll be my fault too. I've got to be the one to try and find him. Gwyn Thomas sat back down and closed the car door. A battle was going on behind her eyes. Where is this all going to end? She said, and Martine had a feeling that she was talking about much more than the disappearance of the giraffe. She put a hand on Martine's shoulder. All right, go and look for your precious Jemmy. But if you're not back in 45 minutes, I'm calling the police. I'm not taking any chances. The pain of losing one child was terrible. I couldn't bear it if I lost another. 
Martine leaned forward and gave her a kiss on the cheek and was surprised to see her grandmother's blue eyes fill with tears. Thanks for everything, she said. She hopped out of the car and ran back along the track to the main road. The ocean wind cut through her thin t-shirt like a knife and the salty air tingled in her nostrils. At the bottom of the hill, behind a high fence fortified with coils of razor wire, lay the shipyard. Beyond it, the sea was a churning white caped green. The shipyard was buzzing with activity and she could hear dogs barking, guard dogs. Martine waited, shivering behind a tree for a couple of cars to pass. She was beginning to regret that she hadn't bought a jacket. She put a hand on the medicine pouch that Grace had given her at the secret valley. In the car, her grandmother had commented on it, but Martine would say nothing about it except that it had been a gift from a friend to bring her luck. Now she drew courage from it. She had also brought along Mr Morrison's Swiss army knife for good measure. If she could get to Jemmy, she was sure that she could help him. When the road was clear, she sprinted to the gate and shipped behind the wooden guardhouse. She'd intended to try to talk, talk her way in, but when she peered through the salt-smeared window, there didn't seem any real need. There were, no, there were two security men in the hut. One was watching rugby on TV and stirring a cup of tea, his chair balancing preciously on its rear legs. The other was on his radio, his back towards the window. He was having an argument. Who are you calling an idiot? Over. Furious crackling followed. Martine didn't wait to hear any more. She ducked under the barrier and ran for the mount mountainous lines of blue, red and grey containers. With every stride, she expected to hear voices yelling for her to stop. But no one seemed to notice her. Except... A snarl that almost turned her blood to yoghurt brought her to a terrified halt. A rock biler was blocking her path. His lips pulled back over teeth as savage and, and numerous as a crocodile's. In spite of the icy breeze, Martine began to sweat. Instinctively, she fixed her green eyes on the Rottweiler's big yellow ones and focused all her energy on dominating him, telling him that if he dared to prevent her from saving Jemmy, she'd personally feed him to the sharks. Then she commanded him to lie down and let her pass. To her astonishment, the rock violet sank to the ground with a piteous whine. He put his paws over his eyes. If Martine hadn't been so scared, she would have laughed. She stepped over him and sneaked forward until she came to a gap between two metal containers. Through it, she could see the docks. There were three grey ships and a blue and white tugboat in the harbour. The shipyard itself was bustling with workers. Martine estimated that there were about 25 crates and several expensive cars in the process of being loaded. There, were no sign of, there was no sign of a giraffe though. Time was running out for Jemmy and she didn't know where to start. How, how could she even begin to search three ships the size of skyscrapers? What had she been thinking? Why hadn't she just called the police as her grandmother suggested? Why did she always have to do everything the hard way? Why was she so stubborn? Suddenly, she was grabbed from behind. Let go of me, she screeched, and began to fight and squeal like a wounded warthog. She and her assailant hit the ground with a thud. Martine lay on her front, groaning, too winded to move. I'm arresting you for trespassing on private property, said a clear young voice. You have the right to remain silent. Martine rolled over, still breathing heavily. You, she cried. A pair of lion eye, lion's eyes gazed calmly back at her. Hello, Martine, grinned Ben. Oh, and that's the end of chapter 22. So, moving on to the last chapter now. I'm sorry, chapter 23, last chapter for today. <coughs> um, and then, obviously, we've only got one more chapter to go later in the week. Here we go, chapter 23. Martine scrambled to her feet, ignoring the hand Ben held out to her. You could have been a bit more gentle with me, she said crossly. I apologise, said Ben, who seemed to be struggling not to laugh. I didn't recognise you until we were in midair, but you are trespassing, you know. What about you? Martine accused. Isn't that what you're doing? My father is a sailor, 
then pointed to one of the tall grey ships. That's his boat over there, the Aurora. I have permission to be here. Martine sighed. She could see that she had no choice but to tell Ben about Jemmy and just praying that he, he didn't try to stop her. As briefly and quickly as she could, she explained about the betra her betrayal of the white giraffe, about the hunters and about Grace's predictions. She also told him about her grandmother parked behind the pines waiting. Lastly, she told him how much Jemmy meant to her and how desperate she was to save him. Please, Ben, she said, please say you won't stand in my way. Ben's face was serious. For ages now, my father has worried that his ship is being used to smuggle rare animals out of the country, but he didn't want to notify the authorities until he was sure. If the giraffe is on board, I think we can get to him, but we must go at once. The Aurora sails for the Middle East in 30 minutes. Before Martin could get used to this new Ben, a Ben who spoke and smiled, and was a million miles away from the introverted geek he appeared to be at school. He was striding confidently across the shipyard, beckoning for her to follow. He wore ragged jeans, heavy boots and a sleeveless black t-shirt and his arms, though thin, were, um, were toned and strong. Martine ran to catch up with him. What do you think you're doing? She inquired breathlessly. Do you really imagine that we're just going to walk onto a ship and walk off with a giraffe? We aren't, said Ben. You are, he smiled. Trust me. Sometimes the most obvious way is the best way. As if to prove him right, a commotion erupted on the jetty. A crate had broken while it, while it was being hoisted onto the deck and what looked like an antique table and several highly polished chairs were, bob were bobbing around in the greasy green harbour. Men were cursing and shaking their fists and two guard dogs were going berserk at the end of their chains. Ben took no notice of them. He strode coolly across the gangplank of the ship onto the deck and through a low doorway. Martin scuttled in after him. Below decks, the ship was a warren of corridors, galleys and, and scrubbed uh, anonymous cabins. They walked as quickly as they could along miles of battleship grey passages and down two spiral staircases, their footsteps, footsteps ringing like church bells on the steel. Finally, they came to a storage room. A, a suave of men, uh, sorry, a suave man was hunched over a computer. He jumped up when Ben tapped at the door and shouted something in a foreign language. Ben gave him a radiant smile. Captain Holloway is asking for you up on deck, he said politely. I'm sure, I'm not sure what it's about, but it seems to be urgent. The man glared at him suspiciously. He reached for his radio. I'm pretty sure it's an emergency, Ben said again. Muttering, the man snatched up some papers and scurried away along the corridor. Ben waited until he was out of sight and then darted into the room. Martine, I'm here. He locked he locked the door behind he locked the door behind them and opened a filing cabinet. In it, hanging from brass hooks, were hundreds of keys. He began to sort through them methodically, laying them on the floor. Martine checked her watch. It was just after midday. The boat sailed in twenty minutes. She dreaded to imagine the consequences if they hadn't found Jemmy by then. There was a knock at the door. Ben put his finger to his lips. The knock turned into hammering. Martin was a nervous wreck. Ben remained perfectly serene. He examined each key meticulously, as if he had several spare hours up his sleeve, seemingly unconcerned that he was participating in an illegal animal rescue, or that a raging Russian was now attacking the door with what sounded like a fire extinguisher. The pounding ceased and there was a still echo of footsteps running away. Please, Martine panicked. Got it, said Ben, holding up a bunch of keys, but we don't have much time. He unlocked the door and the two of them shot across the passageway and down two spiral staircases, darting into a clearing, uh, into a cleaning cupboard when a couple of grease-stained engineers popped out the side door. Martine judged that they were, they were now on the bottom of the ship the air reeked with fumes, the floor shuddered 
and there was a low grinding roar of great engines coming to life. Do you think we're going to make it? whispered Marty. Ben didn't answer. They had reached an in they had in reached an intersection of corridors, and he was trying to decide which way to go. Oi oi, thundered a voice. What have we here? Out of the gloom came a sun reddened man with immaculately cut grey hair. He was marching towards them with a ferocious expression on his face. Good afternoon, sir, Ben called out cheerfully. The man's demeanour changed. Good heavens, Ben, he said. I didn't realise it was you. He looked at Martine and frowned. The two of you shouldn't really be down here, you know. This section is supposed to be off limits and we're sailing in 15 minutes. Oh, I'm so, so sorry, sir. I was showing my friend Martine around the ship and I lost track of time. I must admit, I'm also a little bit lost. That's not like you, Ben, chuckled the man. You know this boat almost as well as your father does. If you take that passage to the cargo section, you'll find a lift going up to the deck. Hurry now, you don't want to end up in Dubai. <laughs> ben thanked him profusely and they ran off down the corridor. Soon they came to a large steel door. A red lettered sign warned staff that they entered at their own risk and disclaimed any responsibility for injuries. Psychological trauma or death caused by the biting, kicking and venomous inhabitants within. Ben pressed the keys into Martine's hand. This is far as I go. It's more than my father's job is worth for me to be caught down here. When you come out, take the lift up to, the, up to level three and cross the gangplank. As soon as you're at the jetty, look left. You'll see a path leading up the hill to a pair of tall gates. I'll make sure they're open. Martine hesitated. There was one more thing. Do you think you could try to get a message to my grandmother? Ben nodded. It's a promise. Good luck. You're on your own now. It took Martine five tries to find the right key. And all the while, the ship creaked, seethed and groaned like a wounded beast. Once or twice, Martine was convinced she felt it a shift in, it, in its moorings. Finally, the lock clicked. She wrestled open the heavy steel door, feeling hopeful for the first time that day. As she entered, a nail caught her t-shirt sleeve and ripped a small hole in it. She pulled herself free, barely noticing it. As soon as the door hissed shut behind her, the stench of oil, animals, manure and seawater came at her in a sickly wave. She was in a cramped container area lit with flickering neon tubes. Scores of crates and boxes, many draped with tarpaulins, were stacked in untidy rows in the shadows. Martine rushed over to those nearest to her and peered inside. There were, there were glass cases full of writhing snakes, cages crammed with crestfallen parrots and boxes full of whimpering monkeys. There were trunks packed with animal skins, antelope horns, grain and alcohol and huddled of and a huddle of depressed sheep cowering in a crate that was plainly too small for them. The last container on the row housed an enormous blue bottom male baboon. When she lifted up the cover, it lunged at the bars of its cage, yellow teeth bared. Martine almost jumped out of her skin. There was no sign of the giraffe. Martine had never felt more hopeless in her life. Her heart ached for all these creatures. The majority had been treated with less regard than a shipment of coal or rice, as if they had no feelings or needs, as if they were immune to thirst or hunger and impervious to pain. But she knew that there was no way on earth for her to save all of them now. It, it was looking increasingly unlikely that she'd even find Jemmy. She tried to think logically. There were no obvious labels on the containers, but that didn't mean they weren't marked in some way. There'd been a system. There had to be a system of identifying them. She studied the boxes nearest to her. Each had a number scribbled on the lower right-hand side of the door. A twinge on her upper arm reminded her of the nail that had torn her sleeve. Something that had been swinging from it. Some sort of notebook. Seconds later, she had it. Number 144, Giraffe, see. She saw number 144 right away, and if she'd been thinking more clearly, she'd probably have spotted it sooner. It was a black painted container, container higher and wider than, than any of the rest. She dashed over to it, 
and whipped the tarpaulin aside. Jemmy was lying on the floor, his legs at odd angles. His white and silver coat was covered in cuts and matted blood. He seemed to be dead. Jemmy, sobbed Martine. Oh, Jemmy, what have I done to you? Jemmy raised his head at the sound of her voice. His eyes were dull and empty. Martine fell on her knees beside the container. Jemmy, please don't die. I love you so much. The white giraffe flopped down again and his eyelids drooped. His breathing was shallow. Martine undid the bolts on the cage door and knelt down beside him. She began to stroke his face and neck, feeling again the now familiar tingle. Please wake up, Jemmy, please. There was no response. Martine closed her eyes and put her hands on the white giraffe's heart. Un unbidden, technicolour memories of their time together came flooding into her mind. Of the evening, she first saw him, standing in the storm, shimmering against the night sky. Of the unforgettable moment when he rested his head on her shoulder. Of lying on his back, high up in the es escarpment, starting, staring at the Milky Way. Of their exhilarating rides among the elephants and lions at Sarabona. Through it all, Martine was aware. Martine was aware of her hands becoming hotter and hotter, and a pure feeling like love flowing through her. A huge shudder went through Jemmy's body. He gave a great gasping breath, as if trying to reclaim the life that had nearly been taken from him. His eyes opened at the same time as Martine's. The light came back into them, and Martine knew in that moment that he still loved her and still had faith in her. Martine pressed her face against the velvety shoulder and gave him a kiss. She sat up, fingers trembling. She fumbled in the, pool, in the pouch of one of her bottles that Grace had given her on that night they'd met in the cave. For bleeding or to numb any pain, she instructed. Privately, Martine had resolved never to use it. It was the most alarming colour and the smell of it, somewhere between minced up frogs and Brussels sprouts, made her want to vomit. But right now, she had very few options. She knew she, knew she had the power to heal, but she wasn't yet sure how much the gift of her gift could do. She'd got the impression from what had happened with the kudu that she still needed to help, the help of traditional medicine in certain situations. Martine didn't know how badly injured Jemmy was or even if he was capable of walking, but she did know that, she, that they had no chance of getting out of the shipyard unless he could gallop. She removed the cork from the bottle and holding her nose with one hand, dabbed a mixture in onto his cuts with the other. It sizzled on application. The ship gave a lurch that almost sent her flying. She held her watch up to the light, only six minutes till they sailed. Martine was frantic. The mixture would have to work its magic along the way. She stroked the white giraffe urgently. Jemmy, she said, we have to go. After what seemed an eternity, he lumbered to his feet and stood there swaying. Martine started. Martine started for the door and breathed a sigh of thanks when he followed her, stumbling a little. They were almost at the exit when a glint of gold and black caught Martine's eyes. Leopard cups? Martine was pretty sure that they too had been stolen from Sarabona. They could even be the cups whose who spore tendai had shown had shown her at the escarpment. But even if they were, there was no way she could help them now. They were lying in a heap in the corner of the cage, clearly doped. With a last anguished look at the cubs, Martine guided Jemmy through the steel door and into the cargo lift. It was at least three times the width and depth of a normal lift, but the giraffes, the giraffe still had to bend his neck. He snorted with alarm. Martine pressed the button for level three and the lift began to rise. She realised then that she hadn't fought past the point of rescuing him. With her, with her on foot and the white giraffe running, crazed with fear around the dockyard, pursued no doubt by men with guns, disaster would quickly follow. She would have to ride him. Jemmy was quaking in the clattering, claustrophobic lift, but he stood quietly when she indicated that she was going to try and mount him. Using the support rail as a foothold, and doing everything she could to avoid touching any of the cuts on his neck or shoulders, Martine scrambled onto his back, 
just as the lift juddered to a halt. One minute to go, the doors opened. Alex Dupree's was standing in front of them, talking on his mobile, mobile phone. In the end, it was much easier than we thought, he was saying, like taking candy from a baby. He saw Martine and Jemmy the same moment they saw him. His face went the colour of a frozen Christmas turkey. He dropped his phone and whirled around. Raise the gangplank, he roared. Stop them. Run, Jemmy, screamed Martine. But the white giraffe was already in full flight. He swept across the deck, striking Alex a glancing blow with his hoof as he went. Alex dropped like a clubbed seal. There was a cloud. There was, there was a loud grinding noise and the gangplank began to rise. On the, jet, on the jetty, men were shouting and pointing and tearing across the dockyard from all directions. The ship began to move. Martine's heart was ready to burst out of her chest, but Jemmy never hesitated. He galloped up the gangplank as it rose and took a flying leap. Martine looked down. There was nothing below but ocean. And that's the end of chapter 23. Oh, unbelievable. We learned a lot there. I hope you enjoyed that. I'll try and take a minute to um, absorb everything that's just happened. We'll do a little recap before we finish on Thursday with chapter 24, obviously. Um, I hope you really enjoyed that and I hope you have a great day. Um, take care and enjoy your uh, English and your math challenges and anything from the learning grid that you'd like to do this afternoon. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.